Hello, you're listening to the HatchetJob.com gaming netcast. Today's show is a discussion about Splinter Cell Blacklist, the Splinter Cell franchise, and how, if at all, Edward Snowden's revelations about the NSA might affect games in the future. We recorded this show on the 15th of September. Since then, a lot more has been revealed about what the NSA has been up to, so forgive us if we discuss things you're already aware of. Regarding Blacklist, the show doesn't have any major spoilers, just some basic plot lines and locations. Danjo was the only one of us to have played it, enjoyed it. Anyway, on with the show. So yeah, I've I've been playing the Splinter Cells, and I really like I like the idea of a hide and go seek where people might die, right? Like especially in the dark. Yeah. Uh, we used to play uh, hide and go seek that way when I was a kid, like right at dusk, you know. So sometimes a hiding spot would literally be just kind of folding yourself in the topology of the grass because you're just gonna look like a shadow. This um, is in in real life. Yeah. So, like, that's what gets triggered when a Splinter Cell thing is happening, is like, oh, yeah, that person's not going to find me, and then I'm just going to bolt for the goal or just snap their neck. I mean, we didn't do that in real life. It seemed a little weird as Splinter Cell has gone from the, okay, Sam, your job is to go do this, but don't kill anybody. These are human beings, to superhero Jack Bauer now, who marks people and assassinates them on the fly, and all the gameplay mechanics especially in the previous game, and less so in this one, are about murdering people. Yeah. Um, I'm very pleased in this one that um, you can pretty much play it either way, all the way through. Mm -hmm. um, I think you could get through this one all the way and not kill a single person as Sam Fisher. If there was some way to say, I don't need a primary weapon or a pistol, you could, you could be fine. That would be a perfectly playable, fun game that you could succeed at. May harder than shooting people, but definitely there. Um, but I just remember, especially like, uh, you know, your boss used to be, uh, I think, Lambert, and he would talk to you. And as you did things that were bad, you'd be like, oh, the president's going to have puppies because you've just murdered someone, mm -hmm. right? Like, everybody's going to know about that. Everybody, like, you know, in the secret NSA society. Um, and that was a big deal. And it would even fail the mission, which was very frustrating from a, a gameplay perspective. Mm -hmm. And now that's completely gone out the window. There's a few places where they're like, well, you can't interact with anyone because your job is to now place a bug yeah. and if people know that you've been there the trust is gone and the bug is worthless mm. but it's never a please don't kill these people they're human beings kind of a situation in conviction effectively sam was he'd gone rogue and so it kind of makes sense that he didn't mind killing people because everybody he encountered would have been uh, related to the guys that killed his daughter. So he didn't give a fuck if they lived or died. Right. But now he's back into, I assume, what is kind of an, an official mission status. How is the agency treating him? And where is it sending him? Oh, it's sending him to all the hot spots of recent American controversy. So you go to Benghazi, you go to Guantanamo, you go to Iran, you go to Iraq. Uh, you hit them all, pretty much. Uh, you do not go to Syria. But I think that's because that happened a little too recently, uh, or really ramped up recently. Um, so one thing in particular that I think is kind of wild, um, well, to answer your your question first, the the verbiage is still kind of like you're a agent of the American government, please don't murder people, a little bit. But the the primary game mechanics are hiding and shooting. Shooting is a big part of it. Mm. So they can't send you into places with innocent people hardly at all. In fact. There may not be a single innocent person that you could interact with. They've taken that part out. It's lost that element of you're a spy that should not be seen at all. So it goes to Benghazi, and it goes to uh, Iran, and it goes to uh, Guantanamo Bay. Guantanamo now, Bay. How does that work? Okay, so slight spoiler. Yeah. Uh, one of the people that might have some information on the problems in the plot has been sent to Guantanamo Bay. So I don't know how exactly, but you as Sam Fisher get sent to Guantanamo Bay in order to get access to that guy to essentially torture him and get information. Uh, with like, the um, And the Guantanamo people, like normal people, they don't even know that that's happening. Uh, so ostensibly they'd be like, good job on the torturing, but they don't get to. And then you okay, have to sneak so you, out because you weren't, you know, you're not supposed okay. to sneak. So you're not kind of busting into Guantanamo Bay, shooting people in their cells who may or may not have had any evidence brought against them, and then running away again? No, you were plot-wise inserted into Guantanamo okay. as a prisoner. And then, uh, well, as a prisoner? Yeah. 
What? So, there's plot reasons for that. Everyone not... trusts new prisoners. Well, no, 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 no. So I don't understand. Guantanamo is obviously one of the more secure places in the world where they keep people. Right. And I imagine they have quite a large emphasis on not letting the prisoners do what they want. That's kind right. of the deal with the Guantanamo Bay, you know, with the hoods and the specks and the sensory deprivation. Sure. So, I mean, the idea that Sam gets put in... I mean, he doesn't have to reveal why, but what are the mechanics by he gets put into this prison as a yeah. prisoner, but somehow he can escape and torture somebody? So it's 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 a little bit more complicated than that. Your other buddy that's the other splinter cell on your crazy plane... Yeah. Uh, as a official, goes to Guantanamo Bay and uh, takes you to the guy. Since that's possible, I don't even know why they need you. <laughs> yes. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But say the power goes down, right, on purpose. And during that time, you have access to... Um, to, to torturing things. To the A person. little bit. Yeah. And essentially, you get to choose to kill him or not. But, well. I mean, this this kind of makes no sense because, you know, America says it doesn't torture, but they cert I believe, if I, if the NSA can process podcasts and listen to this, then I'm sure they're listening for keywords. But, you know, the CIA has people nicked or taken, right? And then they're offloaded to black sites in different countries. And so the CIA and other, I'm sure, and other intelligence agencies would, would kind of effectively farm out their torture work. They have subcontractors in these places who do the torturing for them at discounted rates. Well, you're doing it as an independent agent at this point. You think this guy has information. Right. The actual American officials don't care to hear it. Right, okay. Right. So you're like, I need to get this information, and I can't go through the proper channels. So we'll torture this guy under the guise of sneaking into Guantanamo. And um it right. doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm not. I'm not saying this is. Oh, you just don't understand because you don't have all the details. It yeah. is kind of absurd. But and and how is the torturing handled? Because I believe that in the run up to the game, they had gameplay videos which showed him kind of twisting a knife around somebody's shoulder. I think in, perhaps in a different area. Right. So in the previous game, you actually kind of interactively tortured people, if I remember right. Well, it, so in in Conviction, what happens is you're interrogating people, um, and you're given. Kind of a you, you, environmental, environmental. So you can yeah. smash that. Like the famous one in the trailers is your your, your you corner a guy in a toilet. You, you could smash his head into a sink, into a mirror, through it. You know, put him. I want to say you could smash him through multiple urinals. Yes, right? you can. <laughs> yes, you can. Right. Uh, Very Casino Royale. But effectively, I mean, that is interrogation, and it's violent. I wouldn't know if it would be classed as enhanced interrogation, which well, is the new word for torture. You can kind of, in some of the other torture sessions, place people's heads onto, uh, you know, gas rings or electric cobs and that kind of thing. And I think that would probably come under the um, guise of, you know, not just interrogation, but, you know, burning half their face off. I suppose the, the question is, Danjo, how is it handled here? Uh, similar violence, but just cutscene. It's pretty much you watch him do it, and then at the very end, I think for all of them, maybe just most of them, uh, you get the option to uh, let the person live or kill them. Which I'm not really sure why that happens. I, I feel like as an NSA agent, uh, you should let them all live. <laughs> so we've talked about the, the torturing. Now, you mentioned, again, people also went to Iran and Benghazi. Right. So kind of what, what's, like, what's the play there? Is it weird to watch? Does it make sense? Do they reference things that happened in real life? Uh, they do reference real life. I believe you go to the historical location of... Uh... No, no, it can't be that. It can't be where the hostages were. Um, you just go to, like, essentially they're the equivalent of the CIA, right? And that's one of the few places where it feels like you are actually trying to do good directly without roughing somebody up in the sense that a um, little bit of plot. Uh, the Americans think the bad guys are Iranian-backed. And Sam and his crew on the super magic plane think otherwise. And a war is about to start. And he's like, you know what? If we go to Iran and steal information that proves that Iran's not a part of it, that's credible. Right, right? okay. You can't ask for information from Iran that says they're not a part of it. But if you took it, <laughs> like, that would be much more believable. Yeah. Um, and that part's kind of neat. But then since you're not there, you're not welcome there, right? Yeah. In the escape... You drone strike highways of Iran. 
And it's like, <laughs> this is absurd. Oh. This is completely absurd that Iran would be like, oh man, America just drone striked us. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> yeah, at least, at least they are trying to prove us innocent. That's crazy. Didn't yeah. you also talk about something where he was hanging upside down out of an airplane sniping people? I want to say that was a, essentially a, 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 a sniper rifle on a drone. I don't know if that's a real thing or not. It sounds hard to implement. Could you? Could I don't know. Unless you had like a little monkey, like a capuchin monkey, who was trained to. He had a little gas mask, and he just flew around on the drone. And he was trained to snipe people. Still they said it was a drone, but. And then oh yeah. oh oh, and at the front of the drone, right? So the monkey's at the back of the drone. He's near the tail, <laughs> right? Where the, he has a big long sniper rifle. At the front of the drone, they just have a little hatch, and a little peanut just comes out, and <laughs> and the for, the like the the direction of the air pressure floats the peanut toward the monkey. Oh, I'm not sure this is going to work. There's a lot of maths involved in getting the peanut to go in the wrong, in the right direction. And then also for the kind of drone moving through the air, still expecting the monkey to be able to hit people with the sniper rifle. I think it's just too much physics. Don't give me problems, give me answers. <laughs> You just train the monkey. Every time the, the monkey kills an insurgent, he gets a peanut. <laughs> so, for How those of you... Know it's an insurgent? <laughs> what does it matter? Well, oh, look, you start off broad. You just send him into a country and you say, look for a turban, right? <laughs> Any turban you hit, that's a peanut. <laughs> okay, so, uh, we're talking about Iran and... The idea that you're sneaking in, you're not supposed to let anybody know you're there, but yeah. then you're willing to, to drone strike a motorway. <laughs> and potentially, you look on foot as you're trying to get out of this, you know, secret Iranian CIA kind of situation. You could murder all those people. Really? It's, you could if you wanted to. You don't have to. Um, it's kind of where it's kind of very difficult to get out without at least knocking them out somehow. So... And I would expect the default playthrough is going to be like, well, let's just shoot our way out. They'll let me. It's the easiest option. <laughs> and that seems very odd to me because you're ostensibly sneaking into this country yeah. so that you don't go to war with them because you believe they haven't done anything wrong. But then you... <laughs> you blow the shit out of them. Yeah, you would just shoot your way out. Grena grenades if you felt like it. And then the, the drone strikes, which you have no options uh, on oh, that. Really? You have to do that. I think you can use like a precision kind of drone machine gun so you're only shooting... Not bad guys, but Iranians that want to catch the intruder. Yeah. So, so basically, policemen. Yeah. <laughs> basically, <laughs> people who think their house has been burgled, you're shooting them. Yes. Yeah. You, because because yeah. they, yeah, I mean, they don't know who it is. They, they got no reason to think it's an uh, NSA agent. It's some just bloke who, who broke into a building. Right. Yeah. It's you're 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 murdering innocent people. <laughs> but for justice. Well, so here's the deal. If you didn't escape, yeah. the information wouldn't get it back, and there would be a crazy war, right? Right. So it's not like there's not a, a potentially ethical reason to do so. It's just it's not really what I want to do as a player. Yeah. I just I mean, when when you are shooting the drones and you're, and you're averting a war and you're doing it for justice, do you happen to see American eagles flying in the background? Or no, I no. think that place has a... Uh, like a Statue of Liberty, but if the lady inside were a skeleton? Uh, I don't know if that's a real thing. Oh, no, no, I have seen kind of graffiti like that, um, where they quite counted graffiti artists wanting to burn flags and so on. Well, this is like a real proper, like, Iranian statue. Like, what, what are we going to put in front of our CIA equivalent? Well, how about an anti-American statue? Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> Third echelon, it's the NSA equivalent. The NSA is it's no longer secret, it's very public. And it's very clear that uh, the NSA operates by its own rules and does pretty much whatever it wants and considers everyone a potential target and everyone worthy of, invest uh, if not investigation, then tracking. Right. I believe there was a document maybe done by GCHQ, which is the British Intelligence Services and NSA, or just NSA, and I think it was talking about some new program they have, um, again leaked by Snowden, and I believe it used the phrase uh, citizens and other adversaries. Right. So basically, in this document, the wording is now changing to reflect the fact that if you're not in the NSA, you're an adversary, or a potential adversary, and that includes uh, uh, American citizens. Glenn Greenwald did an article, I think, in the last couple of days. Greenwald is the, what, the, uh, a guy who interviewed Snowden, and who is gay, and whose partner was held at Heathrow for nine hours 
he alleges, as an act of intimidation. Greenwalt wrote an article, I think, about a guy called uh, he's General Keith Alexander. He's the NSA chief. And it's about something called the Information Dominance Room, which Alexander reportedly has, has had set up, where he can... He has, it's basically it's like a Star Trek set, and there's a, there's a chair in the centre of the room which faces this enormous screen, and that viewing screen will have, I guess, NSA information on it, right? And Greenwald says that Keith Alexander's motto is collect it all. Okay. Now, we know that okay. the story's coming out saying that NSA is sharing raw data with Israel, that apparently there's a 52 billion budget for the intelligence services i think that's it's i think it's called kind of a black budget now the argument is that they're not necessarily monitoring your communications but they're seeing who you're sending things to and of course you can be caught up in things which are, uh, are nothing to do with you in which you're entirely innocent and it's bad news for everybody well and there's not a system in place to make sure that you know if you do get caught up in a pattern recognition of well this guy's been flagged as a 68 percent baddie right and everything's happening off the books Right? Like, what rights do I have as a citizen to go, oh, whoa, give me a proper trial, please. Let's see some evidence and some lawyers and some judges, because as is, it seems all very like, well, we could just disappear you. We break the other rules. Why wouldn't we break these? Yes, and I, and I think that's entirely fair. And really, the I believe, you know, kind of the aim is to move this away from due process, to move it away from the courts. And so the question is... Given what's, uh, given how Splinter Cell started, and given what it's become now, do you think in the future, for people who are seeing what's going on with the NSA now, and in five years, ten years, will be designing these kinds of games and writing the scripts for these kinds of games, do you think the notion of an of a a good secret intelligence organisation that only goes after bad guys is even plausible anymore? Because I'm not sure that it is. No, in fact, I find kind of the premise of Splinter Cell far less palatable as every iteration comes out, right? Um, just because it's 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 Fox Television, like it's it's just propaganda almost. I don't think they're making it as propaganda, but it does kind of come across like that. The ends justifies the means. Kill these people, blow this up. Highly illegal. Um, I feel like if you wanted to make a, a stealth franchise now and have it be both plausible and something that a player would want to be, it would look a bit more like Watch Dogs, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're a normal citizen and what you're hiding from are the officials. Uh, Sim, what are your thoughts on this? Because, of course, you know, as, as Englishmen, the GCHQ is, is wrapped up in it as well, but it, effectively we're kind of being dictated to by a foreign power. I I don't know. If you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear? Well, I mean, that that's, that's a, the cretins use that argument, because, of course, the question is who decides what's worth hiding? Absolutely. And we're moving very much into kind of almost Orwellian times, aren't we, where the language around the discussion about surveillance is as important as the surveillance itself. So the fact that the NSA isn't a secret organisation anymore is a sign of the times in a way, in that perhaps we as a society have become accepting of that kind of trite notion that only bad people need to hide. It's certainly a, a opportunity to make a statement about the current state of surveillance and stuff. There's an opportunity for someone to make a game now where you see it sort of from the NSA end. You're tracking people down with surveillance data uh, and, and following these leads, and maybe you got the right person, maybe you didn't, maybe you know you are disappearing people off of just sort of statistical data and network models and, and these sort of things. I don't, I wouldn't, I don't want to say playing as the corrupted, the corrupted government force. That sounds loaded, but um, well, essentially that's what Splinter Cell is. Yeah, yeah. Especially in a generation where people all have iPads and iPhones and cameras and communicate with each other all the time anyway, I think that younger generations don't see a problem with, you know, they essentially, they essentially surveil themselves, don't they, with Facebook and all that kind of stuff. They're just kind of sharing information regardless of can see it or use it. Well, I don't know that there hasn't been a recoil. I just kind of feel like it's when this comes to light, it's like, well, how do you react to that? Because they have all the information on us. It's like our, our pants are down. 
And I don't want my cultural norms of privacy to be dictated by these 18-year-old shits that can't pull their pants up. It, it's, it reminds me of this an article in The Guardian, I think, which wrote about how young people may be becoming more, con- may be becoming more conservative because they haven't really had any other model. So maybe, as you say, Sim, we're going to end up in a situation where what I hope is in 10 years' time we will have socially aware people making games that portray the uh, governments as, uh, I suppose, effectively corrupt or, or, or machines of self-interest governed by corporations. And that's what I hope will happen. But maybe we won't. Maybe we'll just have people who are, as Dan does, uh, kind of says, there are little shits who are so used to taking photos of themselves that they don't give a shit. I, I, I kind of word, worded that poorly, right? If you look to an 18-year-old for their views on how privacy ought to be, that's kind of absurd because if they've been raised properly, they haven't had a whole lot of experience with proper privacy. What do you mean by raised properly? <laughs> if they haven't just been a vagabond, right? As a parent, you know, when they're very young, they have zero profit privacy, and then you kind of dole it out to them as they get older and more mature, and then they hit 18, and now they have 100% privacy. And it's like, well, how much experience do you have with the concept of privacy? It's like, well, not a whole lot. You're a kid. That's okay. Right? That's how it's supposed to work. But then you shouldn't look to them for their views on how socially privacy ought to work because they're ill-experienced. So, I mean, do you think that the idea of, of – agencies in games or characters in games even needing to look for people is going to exist in 10 years time this idea that somebody's gone off the grid and you have to find them will that will that even be a conceit that's worth considering i think it'd be a pretty fun game to ask yourself how do you stay off the grid now especially in england right with all yeah. the cameras yeah um and if you don't think the NSA knows where you typically go in a day based off facial recognition from those cameras, I mean, that strikes me as implausible. They know that. Like, right, like an American institution knows what you personally do. And if you went off of that pattern, that doesn't get not a red flag, but maybe a light orange flag. This is why I don't go out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what Lupus talked about is the idea of being a person who's responsible for doing this. It seems a bit soulless unless in that drama you are playing an individual working at the NSA who has qualms about what's going on. Because don't forget that Snowden was not part of the NSA proper as such. He was a contractor. These security issues and these uh, security tasks are being given out to third-party companies. But maybe there's scope in the future to have kind of the idea of a, of a wilderness survival game maybe maybe that is watchdogs yeah that central conceit of watchdogs that he is either in control of enough of the grid that he doesn't appear on it or that he wears a face mask all the time i mean i think i think i, I don't know how it's gonna pan out but him having a face mask on all the time if you was the nsa uh, you know watching the cameras so you know what somebody's patterns are then Seeing somebody with something pulled up over their nose and their mouth would probably trigger a few flags. There's actually a Columbo episode where uh, this guy commits a murder and the evidence it wasn't him is that he was caught by a speed camera. Yes. And he gets, and this is a spoiler for Columbo in the 1970s, but the guy, he actually committed the murder and he got a friend to wear a mask of of his own face, yes. right, drive through a speed camera. And Columbo catches him out because there wasn't a shadow underneath the guy's nose in the photo. The mask was just a rounded piece of paper, so it didn't cast any shadows when the light hit it. That sounds pretty tenuous. I bet Columbo put an innocent person in prison. <laughs> <laughs> right? He's Maybe. probably still in Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> Slightly more relevant than Columbo. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Corey Doctorow. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Uh, he's got a book that I think you can just download for free that's kind of in line with this from maybe five years ago, A Little Brother, uh, where the main character has to think about this because it's set in the near future, so essentially the present. You don't wear a mask over your face, right? You just change your appearance enough that the facial recognition doesn't work. And maybe you put a, a, an annoying pebble in your left shoe so that your walking pattern is different because that's another thing they look yeah, for. Yeah, yeah, the gate, yeah. Right? Yeah, you've got to take into account all the algorithms that they use and then subvert them. Because in Watch Dogs, it's, it's very fictional, right? You have this magic power to turn their technology against them, and I, th- I think that's, that's implausible. Have you seen any of Person of Interest? That was the other thing that I've just seen on television, very much in the mold of Watch Dogs from what I've seen of the trailers for it, about a man who essentially built the system that spies on everyone and how he 
for reasons we haven't learned by the end of series two, uh, decided that it was wrong and that he would omit himself from it and leave himself a back door into it so that he could omit another guy who's good at shooting guns from it so they can essentially, you know, uh, go around saving bunnies each week or, or nuns or whoever, you know, whichever innocent person needs, needs to be saved. The machine spits out um, the social security number of a person that it has computed is in danger. And the whole idea of the program was that it identified terrorists or victims of terrorism. While he was programming it, he realized that the machine also spat out victims of ordinary crimes. But the government, having um, bought the system, wasn't interested in those people. So he allowed himself a, a backdoor into it where he still gets the victims of innocent crimes, social security numbers, and Basically, the um, the geek and the gunman go around every week figuring out why this person is likely to become a victim and what they're involved in, and then tries to save them. Because he doesn't get a lot of information. Is that the rule? Because the machine surveils everyone, they've got a, a fair amount of information, but occasionally it throws up just somebody who's dead, but they might have an address to work from. Yeah, it's It's kind of like in the last three or four months, just... All the bad things that people have been talking about for years in terms of surveillance have suddenly become possible. Or not, not only possible, but it's it's, it's happening. happening. There's nothing we can do to stop it. I mean, it, it's interesting where you know it's been common knowledge for a long time that that America, and not solely America, of course. I want to stress that I'm not anti-American in that sense. I'm not anti the American people. Also communists. Also communists. But it's been it's been public knowledge for a long time that America has done some bad shit, right? That they were, I think in South America, they were involved in deposing people so that the banana companies could go, could go in. I think they've recently owned up to deposing, to installing the Shah of Iran because the previous leader wanted to nationalise the oil production. And so the idea of, of America using its, its military forces and its intelligence forces to install or to give aid to, to companies and corporations is nothing new. But while that was public knowledge before, it is now common knowledge. And I think that's the big difference. I can't imagine how anyone could write a story today knowing what's going on, write about a, a positive spin on this without it seeming farcical. And maybe the only way that will happen, as Sim and Andrew have talked about, is how you'll have people growing up in the system which think it's completely normal. What can you do to stop what has essentially been carried out as a, as a fait accompli? Well, we certainly need to, at least as American citizens, let people in Congress know that we don't want this to exist anymore, if that's how you feel about it. But that seems kind of powerless just because they have information on the congressmen, which historically, uh, I mean, they just have multiple closets packed with skeletons, yes. right? And surely the NSA knows about most of that. Or even if they don't, they can totally bluff. And it comes off as like, well, of course the NSA knows, right? So um, I, I, I don't want to say that... It's become a political operation. It, it, not that it ever was anything other than a political operation, but something that sways politics rather than is a servant of it. It's an organism that is going to, you know, it's going to try to preserve its own existence. Uh, it... it probably have to be taken out in a kind of controversial way. When I say that, I mean like it will fight back politically to a political uh, agency that's trying to get rid of it. I don't feel like the NSA has ever done anything to make our lives any better, no matter how much they say otherwise. Their job is to continue to exist. We're all screwed. I mean, I <laughs> yeah. think so long as we all carry on in our neat, controlled model of being consumers to fund the machine that surveils us, we should all be pretty happy. I mean, it sounds awful, but we're, we're pretty much batteries in the Matrix. Oh, the batteries are useful, right? <laughs> There's nothing to guarantee that we'll continue to be useful. That's true. I right? Mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, David Simon, in his book, uh, The Corner, he basically says that, you know, the, the poor in places like Baltimore, and, and, and not exclusively the blacks, but mainly blacks, where, where these industries have moved away, they're just not needed anymore. Like, America just can't figure out what it wants to do with these people. Isn't that the same message we have currently in the UK, though? That's kind of essentially the, the message behind the strivers versus scroungers thing that we've got going on here, where only, you're only useful if you are producing, if you're working. If you're not, then you are merely a drain. Uh, 
I can't stop thinking about the um, about the Splinter Cell stuff and the NSA and and the representation of you know who is the good guys and all that kind of thing. And I I I kind of feel like the the gaming used to be a more subversive medium in in some ways. Gaming has always had messages in it that aren't necessarily positive if we go back you know beyond even the first gta which is it has that kind of sub, all the gta's have that subversive message about you know the kind of comic book version of all the worst things about america and that's essentially their shtick isn't it um but, but ge- gaming for much longer than that has had stuff that kind of undermines authoritarian ideas and i just can't stop being a little bit fascinated in my head about when it became normal for Call of Duty to only create uh, controversy with scripted things like no Russian. You know, you dare to shoot innocent people. You know, that, that, that is a huge news story. And I know it's entirely deliberate just to make publicity. But gaming has kind of always been a bit like that. You know, Death Wish on the Spectrum or Death Wish 3 or whatever it was, where you could blow up grannies with rocket launchers. Uh, I guess it's part of the reason that games are viewed as violent and all that kind of stuff. But I'm, um, you know, maybe just goes back to a slightly boring video game violence argument about the difference between fantasy and reality. I don't know when Splinter Cell, as a metaphor for Americans being good guys, became more normal than the GTA message of games taking the piss out of things. This is a diversion, but I think America has all has always portrayed itself as the good guys, and and it had a kind of a special status. Now, when I was a kid growing up in the 80s and the 90s, and America was the land of Hollywood where all these exotic films came from, and trainers used to come from there, and the you know basketball was out there, and the marketing machine was in full swing, telling the rest of the world how great America was. So is it about rewriting history? Well, th- th- there's one other thing I want to touch on on that, which is, I think adds a bit more context to it, which is that the thing that made America also seem special, apart from all these pro-America films and like the, the classic Rocky image there are two classic Rocky images one is him jumping out the top of the stairs in Philadelphia but also the one he's hoisted on people's shoulders after a fight and he's got the American flag dra- draped around him and it was him versus Ivan Drago but the important thing about those films is they would take sometimes six or seven months to come to the UK because back then in the 80s and 90s films weren't released at the same time right and so there was something in that America was kind of a magical place where everything was sunny and everything was cool and people always fought for the right thing against the bad guys and we didn't have access to it. Which made it all the more special when those films came over here. My history of America is different in that, um, you know, we, I think we grew up in the fear of the bomb, you know, in the 80s. I'm still very conscious as or, or maybe a thoughtful child, but the idea of Reagan and... Uh, Oh God, what's his name? Brezhnev and all that, and and Gorbachev kind of facing off with, especially Reagan. You know, I think that I think he undermined the idea of America for me by appearing to be insane, and <laughs> and and later going. You know, I think in his latter years, I think it was fairly clear that he had yeah yeah. I think he suffered a mental impairment that meant he wasn't doing the job, and. Whilst no one would probably give him the button, the well, idea he had that he had somebody he had who Alzheimer's and couldn't I'd, find yeah. their car keys in control of you know the biggest nuclear arsenal in the world was something that I think uh, yeah affected me when I was younger. You know, I'm 41 now, so I'm a bit, a bit older, I guess, than some of you guys. But it was a it was a tangible thing. You know, that fear wasn't you know it wasn't now like with terrorism where it's almost a constructed fear. It was it was the knowledge that those the, the weapons existed and that there were two superpowers ideologically opposed that, that threatened to use them whether they ever would or not have done I, I don't know but there was the continuous message that of this mutually assured destruction you know mad and it, uh, uh, I don't know I think a lot of a lot of things about games then almost took the piss out of that I think what you need to consider Sim is that what was going on in Britain culturally at that time and if we're looking at retro games of that time they would have been on the Spectrum, the C64. You had a a healthy uh, bedroom coding scene, and games were much, much easier to produce than they are now, or even potentially than they were in the 16-bit, later on in the 16-bit era. So you had 
an environment where innovation was easy and people could uh, put out lots of products. At the same time, you had an incredibly unpopular, or at least very divisive, Prime Minister in Margaret Thatcher, who was terribly anti-union. Along with this divisive Prime Minister, Sim, don't forget we had Spitting Image. Now, Spitting Image is an 80s, maybe it went into the 90s, TV series, which used puppets uh, to caricature politicians and people in the news. And so it was political satire, and it was very, very popular. And the puppets were grotesques, essentially, so they em embiggened the biggest features of the politicians and made fun of them. So all of that, I think, led to potentially informed the games industry which was ripe for satirical games, which had an irreverence to them because they were from people who were potentially disenfranchised, which who had a huge amount of source material in a period with a lot of fear. And I think all of that is very good for comedy. As a result of that fear, a lot of the games weren't about, you know, they weren't splinter cell in any sense, new or old. They weren't about hunting down terrorists. And I just uh, is it you know is it because publishers become so big is it because the gaming dollar is spent more in america is i don't know i don't know lupus and danjo what were games like when you were growing up or were did you have access to things like the spectrum and the c64 or were you nes players or mega drive players i i had an nes yeah likewise up. yeah that was the first thing you had so you wouldn't have had kind of exposure or you wouldn't have had access to these kind of bedroom games then because it would have been too hard yeah. for them to make yeah were there really yeah. a bunch that were politically relevant uh yeah i mean some of them even incorporated political characters I, i'm desperately scratching my head now trying to think of the there is a game with margaret thatcher in it you know and, and it's it's done deliberately to, to 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 mock her essentially i think it was more the sense that I don't know, it's weird because cause she espoused the ideas of individualism and uh, the entrepreneurism. And in a way, that's what bedroom coders were doing. But but they weren't celebrating the corporate dream or the or even the idea of entrepreneurism, really. They, it just felt subversive at the time. And uh, I, mm. oh God, I, I, maybe I should go away and have a look for some of the examples I remember. You know, most, some of them I can remember the screens, but not the names. But just things like... Death Wish, right? The Spectrum could only really display things in two colours in any 8x8 eight eight pixel block. Uh, the, we had another computer, the Commodore 64, where you could have multiple coloured things, but essentially the Spectrum, one of the most popular machines, you could have little blocks of monochrome stuff. So it, I'm sure it was Death Wish 3 where you could walk along the bottom of the screen, your little um, pixelated man with a bazooka could blow grandmothers into... Into, into like a pile of, of digital bits that fell into a puddle. And, it, you know, it, it was really primitive, but it was, it was done deliberately. And in a way, it lampooned the media idea of Death Wish games about ultraviolence and all that sort of thing. So it, it wasn't violent because the film was violent. It was almost violent because the reaction to the Death Wish films was so hysterical because they had violence in them. We had, I mean, we had games like Trash Man as well, where you played a trash man, a guy who collected rubbish, and various. Some of it was social satire, like people, you know, he gets chased by dogs and all that kind of thing. The idea of people protecting their dogs, but he also has conversations as he goes around with people about his rights as a union worker, and you know, you know, there's, it's not really all that involved, but it it touches on things that were politically important at the time and in fact I, I need to go back and play it because maybe i my memories of it isn't accurate but it felt even then you a lot... just made it up i know i know this is, this is <laughs> genuinely this is, you could probably emulate it today really. i can't even find it it was called trash man trash man and i think there was a sequel travels with trash man when did this come out like immediately after paperboy because i'm thinking immediately after paperboy <laughs> <laughs> this is 84, this game. So, yeah, yeah, a couple of years after that, because this was quite advanced, really, compared to some of the early stuff. Yeah, 84. The object of the game is to empty all the bins from each road into the dust cart, which is slowly moving up the road, before your bonus points will reduce to zero. If you step on the grass, the bonus score will reduce rapidly. Increase it by completing tasks you are asked to do by householders. Yeah. Your score is increased for each bin emptied. This is where it gets really interesting. 
Some houses will have dogs in them which will chase you if you step on the grass. And if they bite you, your injury will result in a limp which will <laughs> yeah. slow you down. The same effect will occur if you're knocked down by a bike. I guess having a limp must have been kind of revolutionary back then. Well, the, the truck didn't go any slower, so it was a real struggle. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the driver didn't slow down to accommodate your limp, so it became much harder to get the trash in the in the van when you were limping. And in a way, that was you know that's allegorical with the way that Thatcher was was uh, undermining workers' rights because you couldn't kind of go off sick or anything because then you'd be sacked and become unemployed and, and all that kind of thing. You had to carry on. And the walking on the grass is a very British thing because we tut in this country a lot about things that perhaps aren't all that important. And somebody walking on the grass in the grand scheme of things is... No, no, no. It's wa walking on your lawn. It's not just lawn. grass. Sorry. Stay the, the fuck off my lawn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's about that kind of small-minded uh, territorialism in, in a way. And I think the game was deliberately commenting on that by A, but losing you points for it, and B, having dogs chase you and, and cripple you. So this is interesting. It was re-released by... Investronica, which is Spanish. Yeah, so it also worked in Spain. I don't know if they're having the same problem. But anyway, so we've kind of, again, digressed somewhat from from my point about subversive kind of stuff. But yeah, I guess this didn't happen on the NES or the SNES or any of those kind of colourful, cheery things. Oh, you had to get that seal of approval from Nintendo. Yeah. yeah, no bloody grannies. Can you find the one that... Uh, I'm sure there was a Thatcher game of sorts. Let me uh, Let me try some Google Foo of my own. <laughs> have you found your have you found your Thatcher games? We're waiting here with bated breath, Sim. Milksnatcher dot com. No. <laughs> I don't think you want to type that in. I'm just guessing. <laughs> mm -mm. No, no, it's. <laughs> <laughs> and so we come to the end of another show. A long time coming. I think our last release was in June or something. So I hope you enjoyed this and that. Well, if not enjoyed it, I hope it got you thinking and maybe it'll provoke some kind of discussion between you and your friends. Now, we're going to play out with a track called Show Tonight uh, by Alex featuring Stephen M. Bryant. And this is a gloriously cheesy hard rock metal song. Loads and loads of riffs. And I can kind of imagine Sam Fisher listening to this as he drone strikes Iranian highways. Anyway, that's it from us. Thanks for listening. Once again, do your own research and draw your own conclusions. We got a show tonight, boys. Let's Rock! Rock!
got a show tonight, boys.